this crusade, this war on terrorism, uh, is going to take a while. This crusade, this war on terrorism, uh, is going to take a while. And the American people must be patient. You can see in the foreground the flags of the 117 member states which are flying. And now the car approaches the door. This surely is a moment which will live in the memory of those who witness it. Pope Paul VI, the spiritual leader of more than half a billion people all over the face of the earth, inheritor of a lineage of 2,000 years, is greeted in this house by the chief representative of a world organization made up of member nations who can count over two billion people of many kinds and many creeds, an organization which man brought into being 20 years ago. His Holiness descends, is greeted by the United Nations Chief of Protocol, who of course met him at Kennedy Airport this morning. The Secretary General awaits inside the threshold of the United Nations building. Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Jörg Juggler 66 Hour of the Truth. This is the 47th session that I am gathered here together with my brother Tom Fress from the United States of America from Inquisition Update to again come to a reading of the wonderful book that Steve Wahlberg published in I think 2006, End Time Delusions. A book that covers more or less everything that Tom has been preaching and shouting and yelling and uh, telling people all over the internet with every means that he had available for the last 15 to 20 years. And I'm not saying that this all brings it to a conclusion, no, but this book, End Time Delusions of Steve Wahlberg, is something like a summary of the ministry of Tom Fress's Inquisition update. Not assuming something, but I think that I speak rightly for Tom when I say things like that. And the thing that Tom made his first uh, attack to in the world is futurism. And this is exactly what we are in the chapter right now, the battle of the isms, the ism of preterism, which is very fast read over and uh, can easily put into um, into the cupboard, uh, it, it, it won't fall out there anymore, um, almost nobody believes it. But futurism, oh, that's something else, everybody believes it. The whole world is betrayed by futurism today. And Tom made it uh, his very first, uh, how do you say that, um, um, priority to not only tell the people what futurism is, but also tell the people what the consequences are of following futurism. And therefore, it is very important that we go to the roots of futurism. And that is what the book of Steve Wahlberg deals with in the Battle of the Isms. And this is, I think, the fourth reading already in that little chapter. And it's probably not going to be the last because it continues for a few pages. And it brings us into something very 
of some very, very interesting revelations out there, like last time when we said that we all are quote unquote little futurists when we put many things of the book of Revelation just in the very end days, which cannot be correct. And we agreed um, that we are going to study that more deeply, not on this broadcast, not today, but in the future. So therefore, it is now a moment, an appropriate moment to welcome Tom Fress to the broadcast. Let him do a little intro to our reading today. And then let's go back to the wonderful book of Steve Wahlberg, End Time Delusions, and tell the world how deluded, how betrayed, how deceived the whole world is. Welcome to the broadcast, Tom. Oh, thanks for having me, Yerk, and it's nice to be back and uh, to tell the truth once again. And... Uh, you know, the Lord said, because uh, men love to believe a lie, send them a strong delusion. And um, I'd have to believe that uh, that strong delusion is a direct reference in Scripture to what is believed in all the churches today. Futurism. Futurism denies that Messiah came in the flesh 2,000 years ago because Messiah came during the 70th and final week of Daniel's prophecy. Now everybody today, uh, everyone who calls himself a Christian, everyone that goes to church believes the 70th week of Daniel is not fulfilled yet. It's fulfilled in the future just before Christ returns. And uh, that means that Messiah has not yet come in the flesh. And that is the spirit of Antichrist. It is indeed a strong delusion to believe that the 70th week of Daniel is yet future. It causes us not only to deny that Jesus was the Messiah, it hides from us who the Antichrist is. Because we're told that in this future 70th week of Daniel that occurs just three and a half or seven years before Christ returns, that the Antichrist will surface and deceive the whole world and cause the Jews to build a temple, begin animal sacrifices again, when the Bible says the, the blood of lambs and goats never took away sin, to allow the Jews to build a temple, to begin animal sacrifices again, to eat and drink damnation of themselves, and then after three and a half years, cause those sacrifices and oblations to cease. So, the entire Christian world believes that the Antichrist is not in the world today and won't be in the world until just before Christ returns. And how convenient for the Antichrist who has ruled and reigned and deceived God's people and made war against God's people for the last 1,500 years. Can I interrupt you there for a second, Tom? Sure, absolutely. Many people think, or many people who even think that the papacy is an antichrist, they don't think that the papacy is the antichrist. Oh, yeah, exactly. They make, point, that's true. Yeah, they make a distinction between being an antichrist and the antichrist of the end times, the one that you just said that comes three and a half or seven years before Jesus Christ returns. So even when they profess the papacy to be the Antichrist or an Antichrist, they still think there's the Antichrist to come. Oh, who will be the last Antichrist? That's the worst that can happen to us. Yeah. That is a completely yeah. unbiblical false understanding, which That's leads right. many people into perdition. That's exactly right. And so the whole church uh, that is futurist have believed a lie. A strong delusion. And this is what Stephen Wolberg, uh, Steve, let me correct myself, Steve Wolberg wrote about 
end time delusions. And what does he talk about? The fallacy of futurism. The damage that futurism does to God's heritage. Now, Steve Wolberg has taken on a tremendous task. And he's put it in book form so that everyone can own it. Everyone can read it for himself. Everyone can judge for himself. Everyone can compare it with scripture. Everyone can pray about it and let the Spirit of God convict his soul about it. And I highly recommend this book. Uh, it's one of the most eye-opening books you'll ever read next to the Bible. And uh, if you want to know what that strong delusion is that deceives the whole world, even if it were possible, the very elect, get a copy of Steve Wolberg's book and read about the horror that is taught in every church today. Futurism. That strong delusion. It's a lie. Jesus fulfilled the 70th and final week of Daniel's prophecy 2,000 years ago. It was he who caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease. After three and a half years, in the midst of that week, in the midst of the 70th and final week, in the midst of that seven-year period of time, after making a covenant with the Jews, a covenant with many for one week, a seven-year period of time, in the midst of that week, he caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease when he became the one-time, all-sufficient sacrifice for sin for all men, for all time. The one sacrifice that reconciled us to God, that opened up the kingdom of heaven, who gave us everlasting life. He did it all. He fulfilled, in his death on the cross, he fulfilled every jot and every tittle of Daniel's 70th and final week. And, and once you comprehend this, you understand that what is taught in the churches today is abominable. It's a literal denial that Jesus was the Messiah. Oh, yes, I know they say Jesus was the Messiah. Jesus was the Christ. Jesus died on the cross. They'll, oh, yes, they say all that. But then they turn around and say the 70th week of Daniel's future. You can't have it both ways. You can't profess Christ with your mouth, one side of your mouth, and then deny that he ever came out of the other side of your mouth. Do you see how deluded that is? And I've just described to you the whole Christian world today almost without exception. They say that the elect can't be deceived. Are you sure about that? Because I'll tell you what, the whole Christian world is deceived to believe futurism. That's why they don't know who the Antichrist is. If they weren't futurist, if they were historicist, biblical in their understanding, well, they would all know who the Antichrist is. Just like every Christian from the time of the Protestant Reformation, 1517, all the way back to the first century Christians, they all knew who the Antichrist was. It was no mystery to them. They all had relations who were tortured and murdered and martyred by the Antichrist. No one could even ever make them doubt who the Antichrist was. They sealed that knowledge with blood, never to forget. They wrote books about it. They wrote letters. All of it's extant. It's still available to be read. It's only the last two, three generations of Christians 
who don't know who the Antichrist is. And why? Because now they believe futurism, that the Antichrist doesn't come until the end of time. And they've literally spit on the graves of every martyr of Jesus for the last 1,500 years. All those who have gone before us, who have had their blood shed by the man of sin in Rome, have been forgotten. And this scripture acknowledges that this would be the case, that this would happen. It says the righteous perish and no one takes it to heart. He's speaking of our generation. We don't weep and mourn over the martyrs of Jesus. We don't even know who they are. We wouldn't even know. If we knew them, we wouldn't know who killed them. Because our churches don't talk about these things anymore. They don't teach these things anymore. When you begin to comprehend the effort that it has been, that has been expended to deny us the knowledge of Christianity, it'll boggle your mind. The effort that has been expended to deceive you, to withhold vital information from you that makes all the difference, to hide Christian history from you, Your historical heritage has been denied you. You're blind as a bat. You can't even see that history's being repeated because you don't know history. You cannot understand the future if you don't understand history. And you certainly can't understand Bible prophecy if you don't understand history, because prophecy is simply history foretold. And so because all of this Christian history has been suppressed and hidden from us in the churches, we can't comprehend what's happening today let alone what's going to happen in the future. We are the most blind, deaf, and dumb generation ever in the history of the world. That's got to be the case. And I'm here to tell you, as long as God gives me breath, I'm going to destroy the advantage Satan has over us by restoring our knowledge of history, our knowledge of Bible prophecy, and where you start in the beginning is to expose the fallacy called futurism. The belief that the 70th week of Daniel was detached from the 69th week by 2,000 years, that God shut off the calendar 2,000 years expired, and he's ready to turn the switch of time back on. What a cockamamie load of hooey. We've all believed it. We've all taught it. We've all expected it to be true. And now we're finding out just how ridiculous it is, just how childish it is, and just how damnable it is. And I make no apology for my strong language. And when you begin to comprehend what Steve Wolberg's telling us and what I've been telling people for nigh unto 15, 20 years, you'll be angry too. You'll be disgusted. You've been betrayed like no one has ever been betrayed in the history of this world. And you've been betrayed by your most loved and your most trusted, your pastors. That's my introduction to today's program. Go ahead, Jerk. Well, yeah, you mentioned that uh, this generation is the most betrayed in all of history. And I agree. The big shame on that is that this generation, and uh, even the last also for a big part, has had the greatest access to information in all of mankind up to now. We have the whole library of the world compressed in the Internet, and almost everybody has access to it. What an irony. And they don't access it. 
because the only thing that they are going to study is mainstream media that is completely and perfectly controlled by the Antichrist. And uh, when you read books like Rulers of Evil and you come to subjects like Intermirifica and Miranda Prosos, you understand the control the Roman Catholic Church has on all media, all, that is print media, that is movie, that is uh, television, that is uh, radio, that is everything that you can think of, that is social media. Just think of um, Mark Zuckerberg, for example, being a CIA asset. Uh, just that, for example, they control all the media. And if you don't go out of that media and look for alternative media, look for alternative information, then you are betrayed. And we are um, educated in a way um, that we don't even ask questions anymore. And that's the big problem. Because when you ask questions, then you have a mind that thinks for yourself. And the Antichrist doesn't want you to have a mind that thinks for yourself. Antichrist Pope Pius IX, Pio Nono, in the Syllabus of Errors that he published in 1864, he condemned the freedom of conscience. He condemned the freedom of knowledge. He condemned all kinds of... Um, uh, clandestine and, and, and Bible societies where clandestine societies and all that stuff the, the, there's much to, to think about it and just when you look at the publications of the Roman Catholic Church it will tell you so much but you are always um, deluded by oh, this new game came out or did you see this television series or have a look at Batman number 25 or whatever movie comes out there, or Star Wars 3989. I don't know, whatever is there to distract you from the truth. And um, to make this introduction not the whole uh, reading of today, or the whole uh, video of today, um, I don't come to a conclusion, but I tell you the only truth that you can find in this world that is really true without any question is the Word of God. And we have to return back to reading the Word of God. And when we all return to the reading the Word of God with the help and when we pray for it with, with the help of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit will lead us into all truth. And I'm not speaking of quote-unquote direct revelation or how, how Tom Cole said, I think this is the, that is the term, you know. Oh, the Holy Spirit told me this or the Holy Spirit taught me that. If you hear somebody say that, run. Run. That's not the way the Holy Spirit works. But the Holy Spirit leads you into all truth by studying the Word of God, the Bible. Therefore, take out the only correct Bible that you have in the English language, that is the AV 1611 King James Bible. Take that Bible out, pray for it when you study it, pray for the leading of the Holy Spirit. He will lead you into all truth, and then you will understand the prophecies of the Bible, and then you mix them with what you can get out on the information here on the Internet or wherever, on history and measure those two against each other and then you will see that historicism is the ism when history and prophecy shake hands and that's what you want that will lead you into all truths not the big bang theory or zorro or uh, made in manhattan or i don't know television series for all names there are or movies or whatever those will only lead you into distraction Read the Bible, study the Bible, and read books like the one from Steve Wahlberg. It is up on myarchive.org. You can download it for free from there. You can buy the book for a few bucks that I also did. I bought it in English and I bought it in German. And now we are going to read in the book, except Tom has maybe a little addendum to what I just said. I don't know. Nope, nope. I'm fine. I'm ready to listen to what Steve Wahlberg has to say. Good. In the Battle of the Isms, last time already, we spoke about uh, preterism coming into the world, and we spoke also about uh, the Jesuit Ribera, who put futurism in the world. It says here, and this is the part that we read, we, read, uh, we have to continue actually here at the uh, blue little point, but I'm going to retract to this last sentence here again. Ribera applied all of Revelation, but the earliest chapters to the end time, rather than to the history of the church. And you remember that I made a long comment here about it. I'm not going to do that again. We did that last time. 
Um, but very important is that we read the main sentence. Ribera applied all of Revelation, but the earliest chapters to the end time rather than to the history of the church. So he applied Revelation not to the history of the church. Antichrist would be a single evil person who would be received by the Jews and would rebuild Jerusalem. Even the Catholic writer G.S. Hitchcock confirmed the origin of these anti-protestant counter theories. The Futurist School, founded by the Jesuit Ribera in 1591, looks for Antichrist, Babylon, and a rebuilt temple in Jerusalem at the end of the Christian dispensation. The Preterist School, founded by the Jesuit Alcazar in 1614, explains Revelation by the fall of Jerusalem or by the fall of pagan Rome in 410 AD. It's time to clarify three important isms. Preterism, Futurism and Historicism, and I think I added with the title last time also Jesuitism. Because Jesuitism is the author of Preterism and Futurism as it is in the world today. Yeah? Don't forget the Jesuits who swore to work for the fall of Protestantism, who swore to work for the fall of the Bible, and I have an interesting Jesuit quote here for you. And um, <clears throat> it reads, I cannot too much impress upon the minds of my readers that the Jesuits, by their very calling, by the very essence of their institution, are bound to seek, by every means, right or wrong, the destruction of Protestantism. This is the condition of their existence, the duty they must fulfill, or cease to be Jesuits. And this is from the book History of the Jesuits by G.B. Nicolini. You can look that up. That means if a Jesuit does anything that has nothing to do with the destruction of Protestantism or the destruction of the true word of God in this world, he ceases to be a Jesuit. So three competing schools of prophetic interpretation and the authors of these two historicism destroying isms, preterism and futurism, the authors of those are the Jesuits in the world that we live in today. Now such clarification will help you grasp the core issues. I, and this is Steve Wahlberg, will explain each term broadly and even mention some names with this disclaimer. Just because a person is listed in the preterist, futurist or historicist camp in their interpretation of prophecy doesn't necessarily mean that every doctrine they teach is right or wrong. That's why you have to use your discernment when you study uh, some documentaries, when you study some uh, preachings, some teachings and when you read books. Yeah? Because, as Tom likes to say, you have to, you have to eat the meat and spit out the bones. Yeah? Use your discernment. When you read something of an author that you do not agree 100% with, take the 60, 70, 80 or however many percent there are that you agree with and take those to heart and teach those and preach those to other people because that's the truth and leave the rest aside. Nobody's perfect. Only God is perfect, and we all fall sorry in the glory of, short in the glory of God. So, in that, in that regard, I read this sentence, this disclaimer of Steve Wahlberg. Just because a person is listed in the preterist, futurist, or historicist camp in their interpretation of prophecy doesn't necessarily mean that every doctrine they teach is right or wrong. Neither does it mean that they are necessarily saved or lost. That. If they are saved or lost, it's up to Christ. Persons in each school, both past and present, may teach truth in one area, yet error in another. Also, some may teach wrong things, give them up, and then teach right things. Well, think of all the reformers coming out of the Roman Catholic Church. They were teaching Catholicism all their life until they came to the knowledge of the truth and all of a sudden abandoned Catholicism. Yeah? 
They taught wrong things, but they gave them up and then taught right things. Life is rarely simple. I am thankful God himself is the all-knowing judge of hearts, motives and characters and destinies and not man. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? We read in Genesis 18.25. Yes, in the judgment day, he'll sort it all out. Now we are going to have a look, a closer look, at the uh, dogma, I call it, of preterism. Preterism is what Louis de Alcazar taught. Its prefix, pre, points back to the past. Pre, or preterism, sees the majority, or all, of the prophecies found in Matthew 24, means the Olivet Discourse, and the book of Revelation as having already been fulfilled in either the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD or in the fall of Rome. For preterists, or better understanding preterists, to go pre back in time, quote unquote, the end of the world usually means, quote, the end of the Jewish world, unquote. Full preterists believe even the second coming of Jesus Christ somehow mystically occurred in 70 AD, whereas partial preterists still believe in the future, literal return of the Savior. Concerning the core issue, who is the Antichrist? Preterists usually see the Roman Emperor Nero as the number one candidate. Compared with futurism and historicism, Preterism has always been a minority viewpoint within the Church, yet it is now making increased inroads into the 21st century Christianity. Developed in the 1600s by the Jesuit Alcazar into a full anti-Protestant system, Preterism strategically removes the quote-unquote little horn stigma away from the Vatican. With that, the Jesuit objective is achieved. Jesuit okay, can objective. I make a comment here, Yerk? Yeah, sure, Tom. Uh, many listeners are going to be questioning, why is it that all of a sudden there's a, 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 a minor <clears throat> return to the preterist belief? You know, it was never very popular. It uh, was held by some denominations, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I think the Jehovah's Witnesses embrace uh, preterism to some degree. But uh, it was never taken very seriously. The author acknowledges this. But he says there's a, a, been a return to preterism. A revival. I, I, yeah, kind, somewhat of a revival of the preterist school of Bible prophecy interpretation, which sees the fulfillment of the book of Revelation prior to 70 A.D. or or, or or the fall of Rome, which means that this that we're living in today is the kingdom of heaven now. You know, Christ rules and reigns in the church. And uh, that's obviously not true. So what what but what is causing this this return to preterism? I'll tell you why. Many futurists are getting frustrated. You see, the nation state of Israel was created in 1948, and everybody expected the 70th week of Daniel to begin, that the Antichrist would surface, and he would give the Jews permission to build a temple on Temple Mount in Jerusalem, and they would be busy with that temple so that they could eventually reinstitute the sacrificial system, the animal sacrificial system, Temple Mount Worship, as it is called. And then the Antichrist, the one who made this seven-year peace treaty with the Jews and now allowing them to build this temple, would then all of a sudden cause the sacrifices and oblations to cease. And that would be the, the, the single act that would mark that man as the man of sin, the Antichrist. And Rome, of course, would have the opportunity, the Vatican, the true Antichrist, would have the opportunity to uh, create this individual, to pick this individual, 
to give this seven-year peace treaty to the Jews, authorize them to build a temple and begin animal sacrifices again, and then, and then stop the sacrifices after three and a half years and take the rap, take the onus of Antichrist unto himself forever exonerating the papacy. Okay, and so the whole world would be on their face in repentance before the Pope. All of us Protestants who, for 500 years now, have incessantly insisted and proved beyond any doubt with innumerable proofs that the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist. And this, this future 70th week of Daniel after 1948 and Israel becoming a nation, has still yet to be fulfilled. And Protestants, uh, the, the, the futurist Protestants, are beginning to doubt their own futurist beliefs. So people who run out of patience are returning to preterism. Is that what yeah. you say? Yeah. Out of the frying pan and into the fire. <laughs> well, from, from one error to an even more ridiculous error. It's like going from uh, electing a Democrat over a Republican. Uh, the it's, same it's, result. Like, it's like dumb and dumber. That's what it is. And I'm sorry to be so crude in my speech, but there's only one way to convey just how diabolical all this malarkey is. Yeah, some people only wake up, Tom, when you use very strong terms. Yeah, I want to wake people up. And, uh, uh, you know... Sometimes it's necessary to insult people to get their attention. And, and look, I'm not picking on anybody. I've said over and over and over again, I was a futurist for 50 years of my life. I'm talking about me, people. Nobody can accuse me of looking down my long nose at everybody else and picking on them and saying they're wrong, and I'm the only one that's right. I was wrong for 50 years. I'm in the center of the condemnation. Yeah, and who kicked you okay. in the ass, Tom? Uh, the Holy Spirit did one night while I was reading Daniel's prophecy. Exactly. You are making the point that I was just trying to make earlier when I put the Bible picture up here to tell the people only if they study the Bible, they have a chance to understand the right. truth fully and completely. Willing... And you're the best example of that. Exactly. If you're willing to do what I did, and that is to put everything aside, sit down and read Daniel's prophecy, read the Bible read the Word of God, then the Holy Spirit's got something to work with. He can guide you into all truth. Now, you can't expect the Holy Spirit to break your attention while you're reading Moby Dick and, and, and try to tell you something by direct revelation. No, that's not the way it works. I'm sorry, you Pentecostals. I'm sorry, you Charismatics. You didn't hear from Jesus. You didn't hear from the Holy Spirit. You heard from your own wicked imagination. The Holy Spirit ministers to you when you're reading the Word of God and meditating upon the Word of God. You can't be in love with this world and enjoying this world and expect the Holy Spirit to tap you on the shoulder and interrupt your entertainment to tell you what life is after what life is like after death or some ridiculous hoo-ha that they all talk about. You want to hear from the Holy Spirit? Read the scripture. And that's what he did while I was reading the scripture, while I was reading Daniel's prophecy. All of a sudden I realized this is no antichrist. This is Jesus. This is what Jesus did 2,000 years ago. This prophecy is all about Jesus, Messiah the Prince, the Prince that shall come, Jesus. There's not one word in this prophecy about the Antichrist, either directly or indirectly. This is all about the seven-year period of time between Jesus' baptism and the stoning of Stephen. And how is it that I have believed such a ridiculous lie all my life? You talk about a revelation. I never heard an audible voice. I never, none of the 
none of the mystical garbage that you hear from so many people that said that they had coffee with Jesus this morning and he told them a secret, nothing like that. I simply read the scripture verbatim right out of the Bible with a whole new understanding. That's how the Holy Spirit will guide you and direct you while you're reading the Scripture. And what is the Scripture? The authorized King James Bible, 1611. With that, the Holy Spirit can guide you and direct you into all truth by comparing Scripture with Scripture and convicting your spirit by uh, affirming by giving you uh, proof text other places in the scripture he, you just open the bible randomly and the lord will point your finger and your eyes at another scripture that confirms what he told you before it's a miracle and Yurk and i have experienced it over and over and over in our studies together have we have we not Yurk? we sure have tom yeah absolutely absolutely and now we know how the spirit of god works and when somebody says, comes to me or Yurk and says, well, guess what the Holy Spirit told me this morning? We just plug our ears, turn around and walk. Not interested. It's a lie. Whatever it is, it's a lie. And uh, I was sitting there reading the scriptures, praying, reading Daniel's prophecy, and all of a sudden I understood it. And it was altogether different than what I'd been taught in the churches. And it made so f- f- so far much more sense. I was it, the confirmation was was undeniable. I sat there and wept. And then after weeping in gratitude for being fed manna from on high about a piece of scripture that I'd been lied to about all my Christian life. I began to contemplate about the can of worms that had just been opened for me. What am I going to do? Now I find myself at odds with every Christian I've ever known. Family, friend, and foe. I don't agree with any of them. I don't agree with any of them. They're all futurists. They all attribute this Bible prophecy to the Antichrist who doesn't come till the end of time. I believe this prophecy is all about Jesus 2,000 years ago. How am I going to reconcile myself to the rest of the Christian world? The answer is easy. You're not. All you're going to do is tell the truth. And let the Holy Spirit convict everybody else the way he convicted you. And that's what I've been doing. And uh, it's very, very difficult for me to apologize to anybody for what I'm doing. Uh, Some people don't like my bedside manner. Somebody doesn't like my manner of speech. My uh, angry. But listen, when you begin to comprehend how you've been betrayed by your most beloved, you're going to be angry. Trust me, you're going to be angry. And you've got plenty good reason to be angry. Now, what are we going to do with that anger? Are we going to use it as an occasion to sin? Or are we going to use it as a motivator to tell the truth so that others might benefit from what the Spirit of God has revealed? That's what we need to do. Direct our anger, re-motivate ourselves to tell the truth, the historicist truth. The historicist truth says that Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 through 27, known as the 70 weeks of Daniel, is fulfilled in Christ Jesus alone completely and perfectly 
2,000 years ago. And there is no future fulfillment, not by Antichrist or anyone else. Then you have to answer the basic elemental question that, reside, that, that, that surfaces immediately. What is it about this new nation state of Israel? Isn't it necessary for this 70 week of Daniel that they talk about to be fulfilled? Certainly, you have to have a nation state of Israel and Jews living in the land to build a temple to begin animal sacrifices all over. Well, if the 70th week of Daniel was fulfilled by Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago, then there isn't even a need for the modern nation state of Israel, is there? There's no need for Jews living in the land. There's no need for a temple. There's no need for a sacrifice. As a matter of fact, the whole thing's an abomination. And now you begin to understand why God keeps throwing monkey wrenches into this future 70th week of Daniel fulfillment. And even the futures are getting frustrated that their futurist fulfillment of Daniel's 70th week cannot happen as long as there's Palestinians and Muslims tormenting Jerusalem all the time. You've convinced yourself that Satan is the one that's interfering. But God's simply using the Palestinians and the, and the Muslims to keep the Jews from building a temple when God no longer dwells in temples made with hands and preventing the Jews from eating and drinking damnation to themselves by making animal sacrifices. Now you understand what's really going on in this world. It's God who's preventing the fulfillment of this future phony 70th week of Daniel to give God's people a chance to realize the error of their futurist understanding and return to the historicist understanding and see their working of Messiah 2,000 years ago that, that satisfied the law, that fulfilled the law to take the curse of the law away from you and me, to bear our sins on his body, to bear the curse of the law, the punishment of the law, so that we might live. That's what the 70th week of Daniel was all about. It had nothing to do with the Antichrist. Nothing. What a grand delusion that we've been taught in the churches. And the consequences are incalculable. And shall we just remain mute about it for fear of offending someone? For offending the churches and the pastors who have compounded this lie and insist that it that if you don't believe the futurist interpretation, then you must be an anti-Semite. Well, that's the first accusation you'll get from these futurist pastors. That because the 70th week of Daniel was fulfilled by Jesus 2,000 years ago, there's no need for a future fulfillment of it. That means there's no need for a nation state of Israel today. There's no need for Jerusalem to be the capital. There's no need for the Sanhedrin to convene. There's no need for Temple Mount. There's no need for a temple. There's no need for a priesthood. There's no need for the ashes of the red heifer. There's no need for the Ark of the Covenant. There's no need for a temple. There's no need for a sacrifice. It's all an abomination. A grand delusion. You think we ought to remain quiet about it so as not to offend anybody? I'm not going to be quiet. Not ever. Not till I die. Back to you, Yerk. Neither am I, Tom. And that's why I hope and wish for many, many Wednesdays to come to continue the reading and studying of this book, or other days even, for the subject. So, the Jesuit objective achieved, the author says. What is the Jesuit ob objective? Let's see again the quote of G.B. Nicolini. I cannot too much impress upon the minds of my readers that the Jesuits, by their very calling, by the very essence of their institution, are bound to seek by every means, and you know, the end justifies the means, right or wrong, 
the destruction of Protestantism. This is the condition of their existence, the duty they must fulfill or cease to be Jesuits. And they fulfilled their Jesuit objective when they get people to believe the dogma of Preterism. Now, Futurism. Futurism is what Francisco Ribeiro taught. In contrast to Preterism, Futurism usually sees the majority of Revelation's prophecies from chapter 4 onward as yet on the horizon. Concerning the Antichrist instead of Preterism's application to Nero in the past, Futurism generally applies the prophecies of the Little Horn, the Man of Sin and the Beast to a single yet future Mr. Serpent, Mr. Diabolical or Bad Dude who will slither into history during time's last sliver, now usually seen as a quote-unquote seven-year sliver. Seven-year because the 70th week of Daniel. Compared to Preterism and Historicism, Futurism has by far the most adherents in the 21st century, as the majority report. As with Preterism, Futurism's net result is that it also significantly wipes away the beast stain from the papacy. Again, Jesuit objective achieved. And then we come to Historicism. In stone opposition to both Preterism and Futurism is Historicism. I, Jörg, like to call that simply the Biblical view. To measure prophecy on historical records is the Biblical view, the way God intended Scripture to be understood. So let's even go away from this wording Historicism and let's just be Biblical. Let the Bible explain itself and let us follow what the Bible explains to ourselves when we, with fervent prayer, ask the Holy Spirit to lead us into all truth and we get a biblical understanding. And of course the biblical understanding is measured in history, so therefore you can call it historicism. I would even like to call it biblicism, <laughs> if that is a term we could use. Huh? Anyway, in staunch opposition to both preterism and futurism is, is historicism, which is the biblical view, which is what the vast majority of Protestants used to teach. Oh, I should have marked this word very strong. <laughs> it is used. They don't use it anymore. They used to uphold historicism. In essence, Historicism teaches straightforward chronological progression by saying that the major prophecies of Daniel and Revelation find fulfillment throughout Christian history while pointing toward the climatic, visible second coming of our Savior. Historicism also places special emphasis on the ongoing struggle between Jesus Christ and Satan inside the Christian Church. It takes note of Paul's predictions about the falling away in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 3, a subsequent departure from the original faith as we see in 1 Timothy chapter 4 verse 1, and also discerns prophetic fulfillment in the rise of the Roman Church which, although a professedly Christian institution which re with real Christians inside it, never forget that, nevertheless teaches doctrines which divert the mind from simple trust in the all-sufficient merits of the sin-pierced sufferer. While not wanting to attack honest individuals, historicism still points the prophetic finger at the Vatican by calling it the little horn, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the beast and mystery Babylon. Jesuit objective not achieved. Describing historicism as the truest and most reasonable method of interpretation, E. B. Eliot comments on the entire book of Revelation in his work Hore Apocalyptica, which means an hour with the apocalypse. 
its subject matter I assume to be the continuous fortunes of the Church and of the world, that is, of the Roman world and Christian Church settled therein, from the time of the revelation being given, or time of St. John's banishment, to the, to the end of all things. In another description of the historic Protestant view of the Apocalypse, Eliot wrote, quote, that view regards the prophecy as a prefiguration of the great events that were to happen in the Church and the world connected with it, from St. John's time to the consummation, including specially the establishment of Popedom and the reign of Papal Rome as in some way or by the other uh, or the other the fulfillment of the types of the apocalyptic beast and Babylon. End quote. Historicist teachers of the past and present, far from being aberrant theologians, include some of Christianity's most illustrious scholars. John Wycliffe, the morning star of the Reformation, William Tyndale, Martin Luther, Philip Melanchthon, Ulrich Zwingli, Robert Barnes, Nicholas Ridley, Hugh Latimer, Joseph Mead, Isaac Newton, John Wesley, George Whitefield, Jonathan Edwards, James Aitken Wiley, Merle Daubigny, John Fox, Matthew Henry, Albert Barnes, John Bunyan, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, Henry Gretton Guinness, Richard Baxter, Edward Bishop Elliot, Bishop J.C. Ryle, Baron Porcelli, Alan Campbell, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, Richard Bennett, Michael Dissemlian, Timothy Kaufman, Jim Dodson, Rick Burrow, Richard Bacon, Robert J. Nicholson, Dr. Bill Jackson, Rob Mays, Dr. John Robbins, Kill a Bill Calavis, Dr. Val Findel, Dwight Nelson, Dr. Charles Roberts, Dr. Francis Nigel Lee, Robert Caringola, Mark Finley, and I deleted two names, Doug Batchelor and Dr. Ian Paisley, but of course we can add them. Uh, Dr. Ian Paisley was, as we know today, an organized Freemason, and I take his name with a grain of salt, but he was a great teacher on the Jesuit order. And um, Doug Batchelor, I just um, scratched his name because in 2021 he teaches the Roman doctrine on vaccination for COVID-19 and is an SDA member and I am not feeling very comfortable mentioning Doug Batchelor with all the other names we just read in here. Um, the mistakes of uh, him at least are in my personal opinion uh, too big to be named in this wonderful list of teachers of historicism. These may not see eye to eye on every doctrinal detail, but they've all discerned the fulfillment of prophecy in church history, and especially in the Antichrist nature of the papacy as a colossal institution whose doctrines deny the New Testament message of free salvation by grace through simple faith in the crucified and risen one, apart from works. In the minds of true historicists, sincere preterists and futurists have had at least one of their eyes poked out concerning this unquestionable historical reality. Futurism, which is by far the most popular school today, possesses the incredible ability to sweep 1,500 years of living prophetic history under the proverbial rug by inserting its infamous gap into the visions of Daniel and Revelation. In a nutshell, the gap or parenthesis theory teaches that when Jerusalem or Rome fell, prophecy stopped, only to continue again near the time of the, and I should have put this into quotation marks, rapture. As we have already seen, futurism also stops the clock between the 69th and 70th week of Daniel in chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. Thus, Daniel's 70th week, the ten horns in Daniel 7, the little horn, the beast, the man of sin, all have nothing to do with Christians today. Quote, it is this gap theory 
that permeates futurism's interpretation of all apocalyptic prophecy. Unquote. According to most, uh, according to most futurists and preterists, how many prophecies were fulfilled during the Dark Ages when literally millions of God's people were burned to ashes in wars against the saints? None. Zilch. Zero. Historicists see something terribly wrong with this picture. At its best, historicism also recognizes that there were indeed prophecies fulfilled in the destruction of Jerusalem, thus preterists aren't all wrong. Yet it also stands for the reality of future events such as the mark of the beast. Uh, yeah, is that a future event or has the mark of the beast already put upon people years, decades, maybe even centuries ago? And that is the point, and uh, I think this is a good mark here to uh, end the reading for today. This is a point why Tom and I agreed on that we really have to study these things without any futurist glasses on, because if the mark of the beast is something that is still a future event, what was the mark of the beast then for all the saints that have been slain throughout the church age the last 1500 years? Or actually the last 2000 years? I mean, we have to consider Stephen being the first martyr, James the second, as it is recorded in the book of Acts. And all the early Christians in the first centuries that have been fed to the lions and lit as candles when they were feathered and put into oil and all that stuff so that they were burning alive to light up the circus maximum. All those deaths we have to see, what was the mark of the beast in their time? Especially from the time on that the papacy took over. And what is the time that the papacy really took over? It's whether in the 6th century, it's in the 7th century, it's in the 9th century, or it's in the 11th century. And we have to find that out. But to speak of the mark of the beast, even today in 2021, as a future event, I personally, and that's me, Jörg, think that is wrong. That cannot be. We have to find out the real teaching on that. We have to study our Bible on that. We have to pray for the Holy Spirit to lead us into all truth in that regard and to understand what the mark of the beast really is. I mean, everybody who is a sincere Bible studier does know that the mark of the beast cannot be an RFID chip or something like that because we are speaking of a spiritual mark and not of a physical mark. Yeah? But that's something for the future to do. And in this regard, I'd like to say I give it over to Tom for the last few words of this broadcast for today, and we will continue reading in the 48th part, probably next week, God willing. Please, Tom. Yes, yeah, so I, I want to condense what the, what the author has just told us. You know, I've quietly listened to all of his valuable information, and, uh, but I can simplify it. Historicism is the only school of Bible interpretation that considers history. That's why it's called historicism. The root of the word historicism is history. Now we're talking about Bible prophecy and everyone knows that Bible prophecy is simply history foretold. That's why historicism is the only legitimate school of Bible prophecy interpretation because it considers history to interpret the prophecies. You see the fulfillment of Bible prophecy in history. If it's not seen in history, it's not fulfilled. Simple as that. Now, we've been preaching and will ever forever preach 
that history revealed in the New Testament proves the 70th week of Daniel is fulfilled. The most reliable record of history we have in our possession is the New Testament. And it is the historical written record, divinely inspired, infallible record of the fulfillment, the perfect and complete fulfillment of Daniel's 70th week. The same cannot be said for preterism and futurism. In futurism, 2,000 years of world history is completely omitted. And that just happens to be the most consequential time in Gentile history, the church age. Completely overleaped by futurism. That is the most childish, the most irresponsible load of cockamamie hooey you've ever heard in your life that there's a 2,000 year gap between the 69th and the 70th week of Daniel's prophecy you've got to be kidding me how can that be any measure of fulfillment of Bible prophecy to completely skip over history and not just a little history but the whole church age 2,000 years Remember, prophecy is history foretold. How much prophecy can be fulfilled when you just jump over 2,000 years of history? Now, do you see how ridiculous futurism is? The most popular, the almost unanimous view of Bible prophecy interpretation today is futurism. And it is the most cockamamie, nonsense you've ever heard in your life, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever, even common sense. Just remember, Bible prophecy is history foretold. But you just, to fulfill the futurist interpretation, you have to ignore 2,000 years of church history. <laughs> I mean, it's ridiculous. Are you still a futurist? You still hanging on to that cockamamie load of crap? And look, preterism says the whole book of Revelation was fulfilled before AD 70. Well, let me tell you something. The book of Revelation wasn't even written until AD 95. So how ridiculous is preterism? You see how I condense all the information that Steve Wolberg gave us and make it so understandable? Preterism, there's no, there's no secret why preterism never caught on. It's so ridiculous a child wouldn't even believe it. How can you say Bible prophecy was all fulfilled by 70 A.D.? when the book of Revelation wasn't even written until A.D. 95. A preschooler wouldn't believe that load of crap. And futurism is just as ridiculous. Am I making sense? Somebody reply in the comments. Am I making sense? Somebody answer me. Have I condensed it now so you can understand it? Have I, have I captured the truth in the simplest terms that you can relay to anyone else and absolutely rule the day on the subject? Nobody can argue with you now. From now on, no preterist, no futurist can even be Begin to argue with you because you can mop the floor with them. You can make their futurism and preterism sound so ridiculous that they'd be ashamed to acknowledge it, though they believe it. That's how you defeat this preterist and futurist nonsense by just telling it like it is and let the chips fall where they may. 
There's nothing more ridiculous in this world than preterism and futurism. Ridiculous on their face. Unbelievable. No credibility whatsoever. No understanding whatsoever. It's an embarrassment to all of Christendom. Now, you would think as smart as the Jesuits are that they could come up with something a little better than preterism and futurism to deceive the whole world. But no, this cockamamie load of crap is all it took to deceive the whole Protestant Reformation. Now, what does that say of us? What does that say of us? You feel like you need to get some sackcloth and ash? and make a true repentance before the Lord. What must he think of us to be so derailed so easily by such ridiculous nonsense? Let me ask you, Yerk. Have I made it easy to understand how just how ridiculous preterism and futurism are? Back to you. Well, Tom, I think... And that is why I love doing sessions with you, not only this one, but generally. Uh, you always have a way to put these things in very easy wordings. And I'd say, um, let us just end uh, with a little quote from Jesus Christ when he spoke to Saul in the book of Acts. Um, Saul was kind of a Jesuit, if you allow me that comparison. And Jesus Christ told them it is hard to prick against the knee, right? It's hard to kick against the pricks. That's oh, like kicking a cactus. Yeah, hard to. Yeah, okay. I, I I butchered that a little bit, but but you got the right wording there. The point what Jesus Christ wanted to make is you cannot go against the truth with with having a reason on your side. That's right. And that's what Saul tried to do when he. Uh, came back from the stoning of Stephen and um, this is actually what the Jesuits try to do and everybody with two working brain cells in their brain when they activate them will sooner or later see that uh, it doesn't make sense what the Jesuits teach but it makes sense what the Bible teaches and I think what people have to do in the very first place is they have to make a decision they have to decide whether they believe God or they believe man. And whenever they want to believe man more than they want to believe God, they are in a delusion. They are being, as they say, led by their nose. They will be deceived because man is not righteous. The Bible says so. There is not one righteous. No, not one. And I think it is very important to make this distinction and I think Tom that you as always used very simple words to make a uh, quote unquote difficult teaching easy to understand and I want to end with this that people maybe should reflect a little bit on this why in the world do we have to go to school for so many years and universities and all that stuff and study all our life to understand the lie that is so complicated instead of picking up the Bible where everything is so easy and simple that even a fourth grader can understand it. The point is the lie is so hard to study because it goes around and around and around the truth always again and every time you come a little bit closer to the truth it must take another direction and you have to study further this and you have to study further that for it all to make sense and eventually when you are being honest to yourself you come to the clue to the conclusion that it doesn't make sense if it doesn't make sense stop studying that stuff but study the bible study the word of god be sure that you go into prayer, that you take out your 1611 King James Bible and that you read the easy, simple, true words, as Tom put it in his explanation, that God uses in his Bible because doesn't, God doesn't use fancy words. God doesn't use fancy sentences. He is straight to the point. Okay, here and there speaking in parables, but therefore still being straight to the point. 
The truth is easy, the lie is complicated. Do you want to have an easy life or do you want to have a complicated life? Easy life is follow God, complicated life is follow the Antichrist. And with that, I want to close for today. Maranatha. The great seal of the United States. And that great seal of the United States has on it Novus Order Seclorum, a new order for the centuries, for the ages, forever. So confident were that our founders and their idea about one generational responsibility one to the next, that they were confident that our country, that what they were putting forth would exist for the ages, for the ages. That was the challenge they gave us. That is the responsibility that we have. And for a couple of hundred years or more, that has always been the case. We're here today because we believe that, and we believe that the public policy that we put forth, the legislation we put forth should result in public policy that makes the future better. Uh, the Earth Summit Environmental Leadership Act, as this is known, presents us with an opportunity to follow up on the important work of the Earth Summit to develop its blueprint, Agenda 21, for envir global environmental action. His Holiness gave us a message of hope, peace, and dialogue. He challenged us to engage in dialogue, to move forward for the American people. Now watch this drive. Our enemies are innovative and resourceful. And so are we. They never stop thinking about new ways to harm our country and our people. And neither do we. His Holiness gave us a message of hope, peace, and dialogue. He challenged us to engage in dialogue. To move forward for the American people. If you've retired, you don't have anything to worry about. If you've retired, you don't have anything to worry about. If you've retired, you don't have anything to worry about. It's the third time I've said that. I'll probably say it three more times, see? In my line of work, you got to keep repeating things over and over and over again for the truth to sink in, to kind of catapult the propaganda.